it's almost uh, not needed, I think, to introduce him. Um, so he's obviously probably most known for his Super Bowl work um, <laughs> in 2001, um, which uh, we all know and uh, hopefully see maybe something today. And then right now, Takeo is actually the director of the Quality of Life Technology Research Center at CMU and uh, the Digital Human Research Center in Tokyo. Uh, and, but most known, I think, is uh, his time as, a, as director of the Robotics Institute uh, at CMU. And so he's worked over a lot of media, medical robotics now, uh, more autonomous uh, robots. So a, va a large variety of uh, topics, uh, and he's been rewarded with many, many rewards for his work. And everybody knows him. So the, probably one of the best. Uh, so in the computer vision area, we've he's got the Asriel Rosenfeld uh, Award um, for his accomplishments in computer vision. So with that, I'll hand the. Thank you, Jan. So I'd like to start with my uh, sort of a sales pitch of what Takeo Kanari was involved. And uh, I usually show that I have a wide range of interest. Um, at some point, I was even doing a mechanical design. And of course, I did some uh, autonomous vehicle stuff. And at some point, I was doing medical robotics too. And by the way, many people ask, what is, does this curve mean? And I, I usually say, this is years. Uh, uh, this is actually old. There was a uh, 10. Uh, and then uh, this vertical axis is the degree of my interest. <laughs> so you see up and down in the history. Now, of course, in this one, I usually I say I had some moment of fame. And one of the probably highlight of the moment of fame is my appearance of uh, Super Bowl. During today's coverage of Super Bowl 35, CBS Sports will introduce a new technology called iVision. It provides panoramic coverage of Super Bowl 35 from the Super Bowl Theater in Los Angeles. Sports Bowl Theater is an iconic location for the Super Bowl. Sports Bowl Theater is the location for the Super Bowl. So, so this is me. <laughs> this is a gigantic robotic system. You have to have perfect idea of the direction, position of the cameras, and the relationship of the amount of zoom, amount of focus, to the command that you give from the computer. And Basically, I'm telling how difficult it is. <laughs> This is the control room. All right, here it is. This is an example during the warm-ups. Take it just a, a moment ago. The pass from Banks to Davis. That's the way uh, the Jim Nance is a very nice guy. I met him. In instant replay situations in the case of a challenge. We will talk from time to time tonight about eye vision. If you're wondering what it is, this is what it looks like. You got a pass rush. Quarterback, he drops back. Look, he sees a big lane. Look at that big lane. So he steps up into it. What always makes it easy for a quarterback is to have a clean line of sight. Watch Trent Dilfer. Nice look off. Looks to his left and nobody in front of him. Look at that nice lane. He can see the receiver down the field. And what a throw. So this is halftime show. So like that. So I had fun and uh, I usually uh, brag that I'm the only professor, probably, that has ever appeared on Super Bowl. <laughs> and uh, by the way, do you, can you imagine that uh, I was there for 25 seconds? That is a part of the contract of development <laughs> between CMU and CBS. Clause 6 says, Professor Takeo Kanade must appear for 25 seconds 
during the Super Bowl broadcast with his clearly with, with his title, name, Sean. 25 seconds. CMU lawyer apparently had a stopwatch. <laughs> then <laughs> CBS people told them, Professor Kanade, do you know that uh, one second of Super Bowl cost $100,000? You are there 25 seconds. <laughs> that means $2.5 million worth. And, uh, and also, you see, UNC uh, goes to uh, March Madness. And then I'm pretty sure UNC has a uh, advertisement in that program, right? CBU is nowhere uh, much madness, but uh, that year CBS promised 30 seconds advertisement of Carnegie Mellon to twice, so 60 seconds during March, March Madness NCAA basketball finals. And that year CMU's applicants doubled. <laughs> Now, I, I certainly am interested in building this mini camera system, and uh, this Super Bowl thing was some sort of uh, uh, result of the project that uh, I started back in 1995 when I built 51 camera system, and this was 30 camera system. Now I'm building 1,000 camera system at CMU, and uh, when it's built, I'll tell you what it's like. Now, uh, recently I had another moment of fame, which I like to brag. You know Bruce Willis? I was co-appearing <laughs> in, uh, in his movie, and uh, so only uh, three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> This movie actually is, is really trying to say the robots will, may take over, but eventually Bruce Willis, who is a human, will win over, <laughs> over uh, robots. And uh, this was not, this was an interview that was taken completely separate, not related, nowhere related to this movie, but the theme was exactly uh, fit. Uh, because the theme, you see, eventually rob human wins. And as you, if you have ever interviewed by bro uh, media people, they like to, uh, like you to say, human is better. So I, I was once asked, uh, Professor Kanari, do you think the robots will become eventually uh, smarter than human? I said, of course. And then, of course, those people don't like that answer. So, the, oh, then, uh, Professor Kanade, then don't you think that uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, controlled, uh, governed by robots? I said, of course. What the matter? I said, uh, because they are smarter, then naturally they should govern. And so they will keep going. And then I thought maybe I should do a little lip service. I said, well, after all, we are the creators, that's what I said. And this, that particular uh, saying fit the, this theme, so they picked that up and then uh, include it. Uh, one more video that I like to show is the video which I call uh, Obama Speaks Japanese movie. Uh, so this is, you know, I call it face cloning. Without putting any markers, we track face, and then once you do, then of course you can clone it any way you want. So this is what we call face cloning. Ah. So, so I call it Obama Speaks Japanese Movie. And, uh, so right now I'm building a room, uh, basically TV conference room. And I really tried to make a big room. Uh, the, the plan is 8,000 by 6,000 display system, two rooms, with four by four high definition TV as an input, and then send it to the other room. The idea is that you're talking each other. But the video from one room to the other room between the two 
this computer is inserted. So you may think that you're talking with Obama, but actually you may be talking with me. You may think he's smiling, but I may not be smiling, and so forth, so that we can understand what kind of body actions, visual, facial expressions, affect, effect in human uh, communication. So I call it communication lab. And uh, I'm building one. When I finish it, maybe I'll come again and then tell you what happened. OK, so today the topic is not like that. So as usual, I like to brag. So I was saying, look, I can um, track large number of people. So I said, large scale tracking problem is now doable by computer. Then my friend said, Takeo, that's not large scale. This should be called large scale tracking. So he said, OK, why don't you track all of this? And then you should call it large scale tracking. And I asked them why they do this. And then they are working on tissue repair by what they call bio inkjet printing. So they replace inkjet printers ink by bio uh, hormone, basically, to control the growth of tissues so that you can selectively grow tissues at anywhere in any way we want. Just like, uh, you know, um, I think in nature, uh, things like this can grow things as you like um, selectively. So can human do the same? That's apparently what they want. Now, in doing that, so they actually built such a machine, um, Lee Weiss and company, to print various things on a substrate and then control growth. Uh, in fact, they claim that they put, uh, I wonder if, uh, if you I have a picture here. Yeah, here. Uh, this is the head of uh, mouse uh, drilled uh, circular uh, hole here. And then on top of it, they printed uh, cells and growth hormone uh, in such a way that only half this part is uh, promoting growth, and this part is uh, depromoting growth. And then they claim that, you see, half of it, they regained the bone. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that they're doing. So they basically, they want to know how growth is controlled by adding these chemicals uh, they call the growth factors. Okay? So for that, uh, this is a good example where they printed here growth factors. So this part should grow more than this part. Indeed, you see here, you see this part, which corresponds to this part. The cells are, cells go there more often and then grow more often. Therefore, you see this part is, uh, you see the growth is higher. So in, do, in, do, in doing that, they need to measure, for example, uh, if you put 14 picogram per millimeter square, uh, what is the growth rate? And if you add more, what is the growth rate? Now, apparently, you always need a graduate student to do this. And I heard one graduate student spent one week to draw this whole curve because they really have to count every frame and then say, OK, this is this many, and the next frame, this many, and so forth. That's what the graduate students of biomedical engineering <laughs> apparently do. Now, so obviously, that's a bottleneck to progress, number one. Number two, uh, they may be able to count the number of cells and then draw a growth curve. But I think it's almost impossible to know which cell moved where and when it divided into two, and then their daughters divided when to the next and so forth. Uh, creating the whole history is almost impossible by human. Uh, so that means more information needed, quality and quantity. 
And so basically, what they are interested in, and I'm interested in helping them, is the slogan is engineering individual cells fate. Can we actually control individual one? And indeed, if you, uh, if the whole culture is about to be tra in, transplanted to your body, then I understand that some of the cells uh, that grown from, say, IPS uh, stem cell, they, the one which is still actively dividing, I heard, has more chance to become cancer cells, so you want to improve remove it from the, from the culture. So that means, indeed, you are, you are controlling individual one, which is still active and so forth, and then remove it. Okay. So that's what we call uh, individual cell fate control. OK, so for that purpose, what we have to do is, given the image sequence microscope like this, and then uh, understand migration, which is a movement, proliferation or mitosis, which is a division, and apoptosis, which is death, and differentiation, which is the change of the final uh, destiny of the cell. And this is x, y, and t. So this shows growth. And if it like this, bifurcation, then that's when a cell divided. Okay. So can we generate a complete picture of this? So that's the goal of the project. So for that purpose, uh, we designed the system that does various things. Detection of cells, mitosis, the division detection, tracking, uh, filtering the motion so that uh, erroneous uh, motion is detected, and then do some sort of a home, uh, uh, take care of various uh, aspects like uh, going out of the field and so forth. Okay. All right, so let me go quickly because probably most of you are not necessarily interested in particular method how we did. So this is the input. Now I have to tell you one thing, that you may have seen very beautiful um, uh, colored picture of cells by uh, uh, staining the cells. And then the individual cells become very bright by uh, lighting energy and then it does phosphor uh, generate color, uh, various colors you can design and therefore the segmentation and so forth is much easier, almost automatic. But the problem of that idea, of that technique is that then cell is damaged. Quite often cell dies, therefore you cannot, you cannot see the history of that. Okay. Now uh, some technique can make it la last uh, a little longer but you cannot observe many, many days or month and so forth. So uh, in order to observe it, you have to use non-invasive imaging technique, at least for now, uh, like uh, uh, phase contrast microscope, which is this one, or DIC, differential interference contrast microscope. They, uh, they can observe living cells, yet, uh, but the image quality is not good, like this one. Basically, cell is transparent. Cell is nothing but, uh, my, my understanding is, cell is like, uh, in a sense, uh, ice in the water. So it's made of the same thing. But the only difference is the density is different. Okay. Therefore, but both of them are transparent. So if you look at it, you cannot see the difference. So this uh, both uh, phase contrast and DIC microscope actually detects the phase difference because the density is difference, which changes the path. And that changes the phase of the light, which human eye cannot see. Uh, but the, I forgot the guy, a uh, German scientist, came up with the idea to convert the phase difference into the intensity difference so that we human can see and he got the Nobel Prize out of it. Okay. So that, that is this uh, microscope. Uh, it has a various uh, artifact uh, about which I may not have time to talk today, but. So uh, we do various processing. And eventually we got segmentation and individual cells per frame. 
And we also detect mitosis, that a division of the cell independently. Uh, so if this cell goes like this, apparently it appears that cells kind of become little, this particular cell, by the way, kinds of cell, becomes little round, br appears to be more bright. But please forget the, don't forget the fact that word like bright is only to us because there's no such a thing as bright in the original space. It's only this artifact of this microscope. Okay. And then you see it begins to become kind of an eighth shape, and then divide, and then you see they become two cells. That's the history of how division occurs. So we, have to, we want to detect that individually. So given image sequence, uh, the bright point, which tend to be a division, detected. And you do the same for the next frame and then you can connect them and you can have sort of a candidate sequence of mitosis. Some of them may, is not necessarily uh, division. For example, when two cells come, get closer, somehow it becomes a little brighter and eventually they separate. That's not a mitosis, uh, but it appears to be the same, similar. So we divide and you see the tops, top candidates are actual uh, mitosis. The bottom candidates uh, are not. Uh, these, this is, for example, cell two cells begins to meet and become bright. Look appears to bright, and eventually they separate again. So, and this one is uh, death apoptosis, which also becomes a little bright, and then they just stop. Okay, die. And once you get the sequence, we give it to. Uh, hidden conditional random field. And now we use a little bit different technique, but the idea is the same. And then we classify the sequence. And then this is the result that we can get. You see, yellow is what we detected. Red is the ground truth. So red and yellow occurs at the same time. That's correctly done. And if only yellow appears, that's a false positive. If only red appears, that is a false negative. So most of the time, I think it's doing well. I think we're getting about 97 percentage-ish level uh, uh, detection correct. Yes? Uh, human. At this point, everything is human. And once we get the cells and then we track. Now, we have developed various techniques. I just show you one technique, level set. Um, it seems to be doing OK, uh, as you see here. Uh, level set can also handle uh, division 2. So you see here, 2, 1, 2, 2. That is because originally 2, it's called 2, divided the two, so two, one, two, two, in a short-term period. Once we have that, then we have a motion filter that's smooth the motion. Uh, we originally used a common filter, only one, with a random walk. It didn't do as well, so we decided to use multiple model motion filter, which basically has multiple models random walk, constant velocity, constant acceleration, and also constant uh, circular turn. And uh, these are typical motions. So we prepare those uh, four models. And what is happening is a mixture of them. And then the weights are learned, uh, weights are estimated at each frame, and then apply the, the appropriate model. And that generated some better result. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but if you look carefully, this top. For human eyes, it's not even easy. For if you look carefully at the, this frame, uh, cell 47, which is this one, is confused with cell 116. So cell 47 coming this way and I think uh, I think also 
166 coming this way. I, uh, no, no, maybe it's 40. Uh, let me see this. 47 coming together, you see. And then at that moment, identity swapped. Okay, with the con. Now this, with the new one, it's actually the swapping didn't occur, and then it, it's 47 correctly continued to detect it. Okay. So those are the kind of things that you have to deal with. Now, you, as you see, even human, it's not as easy, because you really have to go back and forth. You know, I was talking with, uh, uh, I forgot, I was talking, uh, Ming Ling, is he here? Is she here? Yeah, about this, uh, oh, cloud of uh, Mecca. You know, how, how the people go and then appears to be go this way, that way. Uh, the, that kind of thing that needs to be done. Also, in this particular case, we have to deal with the shape change. Because A and B going like this, and sometimes they touch. And then while touching, they kind of uh, sliding each other. And then, if, uh, and then they change the positions and then separate. So s s now in this case, it's a lot lower to be easier because A and B touches. And then luckily, A and B sort of like this and then separate. But sometimes it turns while being touched like this. Touch. And then during that, it's actually rotate and then go there. Therefore, you cannot simply say, OK, A used to be left of the two. Therefore, when they separate, the left one should be A. Uh, you cannot say that. And then you really have to analyze this partial shape to know which one goes where, likely. Okay? And for that, we uh, added dynamic programming partial contour match so that uh, we can understand which one is likely which one. So this is one example where the two cells, actually three cells, touch each other. And they are doing this. And at some point, one of them separate and going back and forth. You see here? And then eight comes down like that. So this is, in a sense, a relatively easier case. So these are the kind of things that you have to deal with individually. Okay. okay so once you have that, are those cells active on a, a slide, or is that active in the? Ah, more at this point, these things, most of these examples are more or less two dimensional. So they touch. They may be three dimensionally going a little bit below, but not like this. Uh, mostly two dimension. Now, sometimes some of the later examples, they actually fuse. So fuse to, well, that's what biologists told me, that it's opposite to division. They actually put them, those two become one, effectively one cell. And then after that, they always act as if it's one. They call it fuse. Then that's a little more difficult case. Then, touch and then do this. Now, if from computer vision point of view, we just keep track that these, these two are cell number one, cell number two. They touched at frame seven and keep going and so forth. Okay. Now, do you, you should, should this be called fuse or not? Uh, right now, we don't differentiate. From computer vision point of view, we deal with it as a one blob, which consists of two cells. Now, eventually, we have to un uh, deal with uh, lots of other uh, details. For example, some cells come outside of the field of view, and some of them goes out. Some of them fuse. Some of them appears to fuse. Uh, some of them divide, and so forth. So all the technique that we said basically generate what we call tracklets, short segments, which we know definitely correct. Some of, and then there are at, at some frames, their identity, which one should go where, is not that clear. Uh, you cannot, it's hard to make that decision locally. So we should look at a little longer uh, period of time. So in order to deal with that, 
once we have these what we call tracklets and you can think of this as this way that is in a sense it's a two dimension but think of it one dimensionally this is current frame a starting frame this is the final and then this is over time and you can think of this boundary and <coughs> Uh, some of the, this boundary, some of them enter at some uh, frame, and some of them uh, and then uh, enter, uh, and then some of them exit early on. So even though this this is not the final frame, that they begin not to see it. So that means outside of the field of view, and some of them div divide and then goes this and that. But you don't know which one is correct. So you have a candidate. So basically, once you create all candidates, then the final answer is what we are looking at is this complete lineage tree, what they call lineage, basically starting with one cell, at which point it divide, and at which point the daughter cell divide and so forth. This is the final, final, uh, description that we want to create. Therefore, uh, at each frame, you, you create lots of hypotheses, and then among those hypotheses, which hypotheses should be combined each other so that the complete lineage tree that we'll get at the end for the whole sequence, which connection is, has the highest probability is the point that we, we compute. So we de basically define the probability of each tracklet and each tree, value of the tree is goodness of tracklet plus or times initially, times the probability or the certainty of the division which is controlled by mitosis detection and like and also uh, like a Connect, uh, connectivity, closeness, and so forth, and goodness of this track, which is, of course, further down tree. So that is actually tree. So you can see it's a recursively defined. See? It, at the top level, goodness of the tree consists of tracklet times division probability times the remaining thing, which is a tree again, so it's a tree probability, and then that tree, tree probability is further divided into division and subtrees and so forth. So that's a complete uh, um, structure of the whole uh, equation. So you ex basically expand all of them and evaluate the maximum of that uh, and then you create the search space. So graphically speaking, this is a tracklet, and at some point you don't know which one goes where, and, but that process will make it explicitly connect. Okay. So that's the final output of this system. So you see uh, this is the tracklet, and this is a cleaned up associ total association, which represent the final result. Of, uh, of the cell growth. Okay, so it's like like this. It's doing pretty well. You see, it's a you see divide, divide, and so forth. Okay. See. So that's that's now. Of course, we we do all of them, all of them. So this is a good one example. So this is the input image and tract, and that is the x, y, t uh, tree representation of how it's moved. So if you rotate this way, this simply means the trajectory of all cells. Okay. Actually, I, I, I non-biologist, I thought very interesting to me. Because I thought these cells tend to move kind of like this. But you see, those cells don't move like that. It's more or less moving its neighbors. Okay. 
So this is the initial example. Right now it's 2,900 cells. Of course, when it comes to this level, it's very difficult to know how good this is because the human uh, is also impossible or I don't think anybody wants to spend time. If you're willing, I'm very happy to <laughs> ask you. So my students actually took only part of it and then uh, carefully analyzed and then check, compared it with the true, with, a, with a, what we got. And then basically about 80 some percent, truck wise, truck wise, okay? So this is what we call noodle map, noodle video. Basically that XYT of this huge trot result. Yeah. Now when it comes to this level, of course, I don't think human would ever be able to do. So they are fairly happy for some purposes, some purposes, okay? Like a rough motion of this and that, or how many typically comes here. Uh, is, is the growth coming from what percentage of the growth of this cell regions that you want cell grow more? What percentage of that due to cells coming in or actually growing there, okay? That kind of question can be answered by this technique. Uh, and then so basically we got the complete lineage tree, family tree. It's so dense, you cannot see. So if you expand like this, this particular cell divide at some point, and then further divide when it comes such and such time, and so forth. Okay. So we can get this so-called population lineage tree. And uh, there are many examples. Uh, we run this code on various data that my uh, collaborator at Cunning Mellon uh, get data or uh, we also have other people uh, like NIH or University of Pittsburgh, they like us process their data so they always come and then Professor Kanata, can you do this and then every time it, it's a difficult so we changed, the, we added the program and keep adding uh, new capabilities. Okay, so let's see. Oops. So this is an NIH example, and this is a lineage tree. So red means the human created the lineage tree as a ground truth. Red means the human generated ground truth and computer generated ground truth. Uh, red is computer generated ground truth. So like this one, and then uh, it's overlapped. So when you see only red, that means it's correct. So this one is correct. For example, this one is perfectly correct. Well, it's only once, by the way. Okay? It's correct. This one is almost correct because this is perfectly correct. This is perfectly correct. This is incorrect in the sense that what computer thinks division occurred is a little bit later than human annotator thinks when division occurred. So this is the Error, in, in that sense, error of the timing at which division occurred, okay? And so for this one, the program missed the fact that there was a division because program thought it's just going this way and somehow the other one was missed. Uh, uh, now, as a trajectory, this was recognized as a trajectory, even though identity is missed. So if human is willing to say, well, actually that one is this one. So if human is willing to edit, then it's, it's still useful. Okay. Uh, this is a more, little more difficult example. I wonder this is, yeah, so it's a more difficult example, if, a little more. And you see, this is a ground truth. This is computer annotation. And 
you, you see, it's almost there. Right? The middle one is, to me, almost there. This one is almost perfect. The only thing is that this fact that it's divided is missed. So it thinks that it occurred somewhere right, mistakenly. Now, how to, how to measure the goodness of such a program? That, of course, is very difficult. So one of the measures that we have is what we call effectiveness. That is, if cell moves 100 frames, and if the computer tracks 60 frames and missed at the 60th frame, and then somehow it goes wrong, then we call it 60% effectiveness. Effective. So in other words, it covers. Okay. In that sense, these are effectiveness is about 90 percentages. And then, of course, effectiveness goes wrong, lower in general, as time goes, because the problem becomes more and more difficult. Okay. Now, you should realize that the lineage tree is very tough, because there's a slight error than tracking error. Even though the tra I found that, that even though the tracking, er tracking correctness is 90 some percent, lineage-wise, it's pretty bad. It really has to be very good in order to lineage to be at the level of 80, 90. Now, of course, one other problem is, of course, if, you, if this is the case, then generating a lot more false track will increase the effectiveness. So we call the other one is purity. That is, what error is included? So even though this one, originally this was what happened, and it recognized as such, effectiveness-wise it's pretty good for this track. Okay? But its purity is wrong, because the, it's kind of a wrong one reduce the purity, so we penalize that. In other words, false negative, uh, false, uh, you penalize false positive. And we evaluate it with uh, 14 sequences, I think. No, no, it's 40, 48 sequences, each of which cost, each of which is 780 frames. Now, of course, you cannot create the fully human annotation for 740 frames, each of which start about 10 cells. At the end, the cells are as many as uh, several hundreds, okay, or even more. So it's impossible. So yet, we actually did an amazing thing. We divided our task into all of the members and started only three cells, out of only three cells in the first frame, and then track that one. In the first frame, this one. Go this, and this, 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 and then it divide, and then both of them are tracked. Okay. So the complete history of three original cells. Okay. That alone was really a tough. I was assigned one of them, and then I gave up, and then gave it to my students <laughs> for one dinner. Uh, I, I actually, I, could, I thought I could do it on the airplane and so forth, but I gave up. Uh, now, in order to get the if purity, you have to know everything, because we need false positive. So in order to know that, we need to know everything. So all, one sequence, heroically annotated completely, 780 frames. And purity is about 93%. Effectiveness is 82%. Uh, and then for those part that was annotated, uh, we can compute the effectiveness, which is about 80% to 60 to 80%. That's about the range that we can get today. Okay. So why do they, are they interested in it? I think we, can, we may be able to answer many interesting questions.
For example, if we get to this lineage tree, they are interested in uh, what they call synchronization. Um, apparently, when cells divide, the daughters tend to behave the same way. How far they behave the same way, it's called synchronization. So if we actually get the lineage tree, then it's not difficult to compute such a thing. Also, division rate, okay? at which rate this division occurs. What does it control? So is the density? Of course, apparently control. So, so you can measure lots of density, motion, speed, and whatever. And, and I was told that usually when cells are moving a lot, they don't uh, divide a lot and then kind of a not the slow down and then tend to divide and then each of them will go like this and then slow down and divide and so forth. That's what appears to be the case. Okay? How true? It's obvious once we have this data then you can say oh that's true, that's not true or this is a correlation between speed and, and so forth. Okay? And more interesting that they're interested in differentiation. As you know, stem cells eventually differentiate into a particular cell, type of cell. So imagine that the stem cell divide, differentiate into two types, A type, green type, and red type. Okay? Now, interesting question is, is that differentiation, fate of differentiation determined in the last minute, like this? Or is that determined much earlier so that everything after after this branch will become red or become green and so forth. They're interested. And obviously, unless you track all the way to the end, you cannot know which one is true, how true, and what is the, if this is the case, what is this length, and so forth. Okay? Now, we should be able to give a good tool for them, and so forth. And what controls this? So one of the, uh, one of the applications that we did is uh, called wound healing uh, assay. That is, you culture cells like this, and you scratch to simulate wound, and then let it go, let them go. Then the cells on both sides begins to come in and fill the gap, which is basically, I was told, wound healing process. So it's, this is called wound healing assay that simulate wound healing and then it's used to test, for example, various uh, effectiveness of various medicine to see whether this is better than that and then and so forth. Okay? So naturally, uh, pharmaceutical company wants to know how effective this is in terms of movement of the cells and so forth. Okay? So this is, the one, this is the one example, how cells come in and so forth. Then we analyze the pro this one. So the red is the, those that are coming from left, Blue, blues are coming from the right. And so forth. Like that. By the way, I thought it would be much more interesting to keep going. And I wanted to know, personally, <laughs> as a non-biologist, non whether the red, you know, blue comes here, red comes here, they meet. I was interested, as an amateur biologist, whether they keep going and mingle, or they say, OK, we meet. Blue guys don't come anymore. And red guy, okay, we, don't, we won't go anymore, and then sort of don't mingle as much. I thought that was interesting. And I asked the biologists, why don't you do that? And they said, I've never thought of it. I thought when they meet, that's the end of the experiment. Uh, once you actually draw the red and blue, naturally that, that amateurish question comes to your mind, at least my mind. And uh, it was interesting that biologists told me, oh, we never thought such a thing. 
when it meets, that's it. when they meet, that's the end, they said. Now, so you, this is, uh, I think, 90% of the density style, and then this, basically, this is time, and this brightness shows density as a vertical column. So you see, initially, high density, low, medium, low, nothing, low, medium, high, and then this front, you can see this is the front, comes in, and then they meet after this much time. This is time, okay? Now, they, and then you can see what is driving this migration. It's obvious that if you compute the local density at each point, in other words, if you compute here, density of this density minus this density, we call it density gra gradient, is about the same. Here, density gradient is high. This is high density, low density, so density is going that way. Okay. So if you compute density, this is this, this one, low, high, even, high, high, or medium, medium, low, low. This is low to high, this way. And then if you map the density versus motion, it's beautiful linear. So it's obvious motion is driven by density. Now, uh, they actually can add some chemical which sort of pro uh, block motion or growth uh, of healing. Is that true? So do the same thing, and this is analysis. And you see the invasion of this front is much slower pace than previous case. Yeah? So if you compare without this chemical, this is the growth speed, speed that comes in. So by this time it meets. This one is much slower, so it takes this much to meet. So that's the effect of this medicine. Uh, also interesting is that if you compute the density, see, this cell, right cells moving this way, left moving this way. So this is the region that is to be filled. And then you divide this into column. Let's call L1 column, L2 column, L3 column, meaning L1 is the column which closest to opening, L2 is next opening, and so forth. Okay? And then if you plot, if you compute the motion of each region, then for control, this is total average. For control, you see the left side, this is Rose map, which shows the distribution of the motion percentage. You see, obviously, the left-hand side most of them moving to left, to, to right. Right hand side, most of them to moving left. Okay? Now, if you add a lot of chemicals, it's interesting that distribution is now spread. So in other words, this chemical may be affecting not necessarily the motion speed itself, but letting them move more random manner, therefore, in total, the movement to the left or movement to the right is not as fast. Uh, it could be the case. Now, I don't know whether that's a good conclusion or not. Okay. So, eventually, as I said, we should be able to do this kind of thing in real time so that as it goes, and we know the bad guys, and then pick them up by laser tweezers, and then use good one only. That kind of thing may be possible. I don't know. Uh, and also, we can connect this system in real time to, bio to biology lab, uh, which they have now uh, automated 
microscope that can take pictures every five minutes and so forth. So we can do. And uh, indeed, we actually connected between Carnegie Mellon and one biology lab in Japan, and then over the net. Every five minutes, image was taken there, and then shipped here, and then analyzed, and shipped the data back, and then they, they, they do uh, coding control. So eventually, what I'm interested in is to create this system at Carnegie Mellon, where the users who may have online microscope or who may have already data can submit the data to our system. And then we analyze and put the data back on our database. And they can retrieve it to do their research. And if they agree, this result may be available by, to other uh, biologists too, so that they can do some research. Now, on my part, we have a new data. And then we know which data we, can't, we cannot handle. So then we work individually. That problem to that student, that problem to that student. And eventually, we can solve all the problems that may consist of this problem. So once we can do that, I think we can contribute a lot. And in fact, one of my favorite stories is that when I give this talk at uh, NIST, and one of the things uh, thing that the host told me, Takeo, your talk was the most interdisciplinary, had the most interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary audience biologists who were interested in compound powder uh, uh, physics, who wanted to know where the powder goes where and so forth, to biology, to computer vision, to robotics, and so forth. And then one of the very encouraging comments that I, get, that I got from biologists was, Professor Kanade, what, if you can do what you are promising, then it will change my life and human's life. And uh, I think I have done some you know, people say, oh, that's cute, Professor Kanade. But I've never told in my whole life what I'm doing is useful to human life. And this was for the first time. And in that sense, I was very excited about this kind of research. And uh, I think the computer vision can uh, contribute. And I, I thought that it's a cute. Thank you very much. <laughs>